Hello, everyone. Welcome to PS Platypus 2022. I'm Kyle, and today I'm going to be running you through some respiratory anatomy. So to start off, let's talk about the pathway that air takes when you take in a breath to get all the way into your lungs and to your alveoli. So when we take a breath in through our nose or through our mouth, it enters our nasal or oral buccal cavity, then travels down the pharynx and the larynx, which we'll talk more about in head and neck later this year, and then enters down the lower respiratory tract, uh, down the trachea or windpipe, into the primary bronchi or the left and right, right and left main bronchi, then the secondary tertiary bronchi, so the secondary bronchi, the tertiary bronchi, down bronchioles and to the alveoli, which is the site of actual gas exchange. Now, all of that is just to give you a basic framework, orientate yourself to the anatomy. Really what we need to know is that the right main bronchus uh, is shorter, wider, and more vertical than the left main bronchus, as you can see here. Now, what this means clinically is that objects are more likely to be aspirated down the right main bronchus and into the right lung as you can see here. Now, importantly, this isn't always a consistent thing, but generally aspirated food will end up in different places depending on how the patient is positioned, how they're sitting or standing. If they're sitting or standing up, their thorax is erect, then an aspirated object is most likely to go down to the posterior basal segment of the right inferior lobe, as you can see here. If they're supine or lying down on their back, it's most likely to go to the superior segment of the right inferior lobe. And if they're laying on their right hand side, then it's most likely to go to the posterior segment of the right upper lobe, as you can see here. Now you don't need to know all of these segments. I certainly didn't, but it's good to remember these three, uh, especially for those classic multiple choice questions. Now, all of this uh, that we're talking about, breathing in an object, um, usually food, but it could also be uh, a liquid, it could also be your own vomit. Um, it all results in something called aspiration pneumonia. Pneumon referring to the lungs, um, pneumo meaning like air. Uh, so infection of the lungs due to aspiration. Moving on, let's talk a bit about the lungs and the hyla. So the lungs consist of lobes. So these five lobes that we can see here, and they're separated by fissures, these lines, these double fold invaginations of visceral pleura that separate the lobes. Now the right lung here has three lobes while the left lung has two lobes, a superior and inferior lobe. Uh, so both sides have an oblique fissure. However, due to the right lung having three lobes, it also has a horizontal fissure between the superior and middle lobes. Now, when we're talking about hyla, which is the plural of hilum, the hyla are the mediastinal, so this middle part, entries and exits for the lung associated structures. So things like pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, the bronchi, which was how that air was getting in and out of the lungs, uh, and lymphatics, among other things. Now, we can see the left and right hyla here. But the most important thing we need to know is the position of the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins, and the main bronchi in relation to each other. As you can see, the hilum of the right lung and the hilum of the left lung are not mirror images. So that's why we might use a mnemonic to remember the position of the pulmonary arteries in relation to the main bronchi. So for the right hilum, what we can see is that the pul right pulmonary arteries, these purple things, are anterior, so in front of the right main bronchus. So you can see that, the purple in front of the gray. The pulmonary, right pulmonary veins are sort of anterior and inferior to all of it, predominantly inferior. For the left hilum, however, it is uh, the, right, the left pulmonary arteries, sorry, are superior to the left main bronchus. So that's how R-A-L-S, right uh, pulmonary arteries, anterior to right main bronchus, left pulmonary arteries, superior to left main bronchus. So we can see the left pulmonary arteries are above the left main bronchus, whereas the right pulmonary arteries are in front of or anterior to the right main bronchus. 
And then you just also need to remember where the, the pulmonary veins are, which is generally this sort of anterior and inferior for the left, and mostly inferior with a, a bit of anterior for the right. Now, moving on to pleura, the pleura is one continuous sheet of simple squamous epithelial cells. Uh, it derives, I think, from mesothelium uh, that surrounds the lungs. And we've actually covered this already last year a little bit, but basically it decreases friction when breathing. So when we breathe in and out, you can imagine the lungs expand and contract. So we need to make sure that we're having as little friction with the chest wall as possible. Also, when we move our chest around, when we're moving around, it enables coordination between the thoracic cage, its movements, and the lungs. So it basically, its main aim is to reduce friction as well as allowing coordination. Now we have two layers to the pleura. We have the parietal pleura, which is more external, as we can see in green. You can see that it's actually one continuous sheet. It folds around. And the analogy sometimes is sort of putting your fist into a balloon um, where your fist is the lungs and the balloon, the membrane of the balloon is the pleura. So the pleura that touches or the membrane of the balloon that touches your fist is the visceral pleura, touching, touching the viscera or the parenchyma, the, the functional tissue of the lungs. While the parietal pleura is the external part of the pleura that is touching the chest wall or sort of the internal membrane, the endothoracic fascia. Uh, but it's more external. That's the main point. Um, and between the parietal and visceral pleura is a very small amount of thin lubricating fluid um, that is called pleural fluid that helps reduce that friction once again. Now, when we're looking at the pleura and the lungs, we'll notice that the pleura actually extends, uh, the parietal pleura, that external layer, extends below the borders of the visceral pleura, which is attached to the lungs. Now, the main thing that we need to remember is the, these mnemonics. Um, just a, it goes down two for each anterior, then lateral, then posterior. And for the lungs, it starts at T6, whereas for the parietal pleura, it starts at T8. It's two layers, two, two spinal levels lower. So at T6 in the midclavicular line, that is the border of the lungs. That's where they extend to. In the mid axillary line, so the mid armpit is another way to remember it, but mid axillary line, it is at T8 spinal level and at T10 in the mid scapular line. Now, contrarily, for the parietal pleura, it extends two spinal levels lower. So it's T8 for the MCL, the mid clavicular line, T10 for the mid axillary line, and T12 for the mid scapular line, as you can see here. Uh, six, eight, and 10 ish for the lungs. And then eight, sorry, eight, 10, and 12 for the parietal pleura. Now, because of this uh, space here, well, it's more of a potential space. Um, it just has that small amount of parietal fluid in there, usually. But this potential space, uh, the, these are called uh, pleural recesses, uh, specifically the costium, costomediastinal recess near the mediastinum, costo meaning ribs, and the costodiaphragmatic, so this lower uh, recess here. And so fluid will pull in these spaces if it enters between the uh, visceral and parietal pleura. So the pleural cavity is what we call that, that potential space. If that happens, it's called a pleural effusion. It's a buildup of fluid in the pleural cavity. And so the main signs and symptoms you'll have for a pleural effusion are dyspnea or shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. So that sort of sharp uh, pain on inspiration due to the irritation of the pleura. So they're irritated and inflamed. The other thing that you will see on chest X-ray is that the costophrenic angle, which is usually nicely defined as we can see on the left here or on the right here in this image, 
you'll actually have blunting because fluid is building up in this costodiaphragmatic recess or costophrenic recess. And so you've got blunting of the costophrenic angles. They're blunt, see here, versus this sharp angle. So you'll have blunting of costophrenic angles and that indicates pleural effusion, fluid in the pleural cavity. Finally, we'll just talk briefly on the diaphragm. So this is revision from last year, but the diaphragm is the main muscle of inspiration um, and exhalation. Uh, and it's active, you breathe in, that tightens and contracts the diaphragm and opens up the thorax to uh, accept air into the lungs. <laughs> I'm phrasing it a bit poorly, but you get the idea, hopefully. It's innervated by the phrenic nerve, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive, which means that if you have uh, irritation of the diaphragm, pain will refer to the neck because it refers to the phrenic nerve. The main thing to remember here is the diaphragmatic hiatuses, and I have a nice little mnemonic for that, and it's count the letters. So vena cava, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters, is at T8. The esophageal hiatus, or where the esophagus, esophagus goes through to get down to the stomach, um, is at T10, because there's 10 letters in esophagus, and aortic hiatus has 12 letters, so that's at T12. So the hiatuses are actually are at different spinal levels because the diaphragm isn't just a nice flat um, thing. All right, that's about it for me for thorax today. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you next time.